From city chaos to daily calm, side by side, we live, laugh, journey in a world that forgets compassion, respect, unity. We were made for community, for life together. Learn to live as a compassionate community. Learn to live side by side. My family, probably like your family, is a story of opposites and extremes. If you go high enough on our family tree to generations long removed or wide enough to those still living but distant relatives with prefixes like second, third, fourth cousin, twice removed, if you do that, you'll find people who are all related in some way, either connected by genetics or by marriage, or if I'm honest, in at least two scandals, by both. But in many, in, in many cases, their commonality stops with the DNA and the family name. Other than that, the only thing that we really have in common is that we have nothing in common. I mean, from political bent to faith position to stances on social issues to parenting philosophy, from wealth to poverty, that we got workaholics and lazaholics and alcoholics, it's, it's hard to even recognize that we're one family save for the lines on a genealogy. Can you relate to that? I bet this is true for you too. Some of the factors that make us different are about our upbringing, right? Some of, of our upbringing comes from different cultures, sometimes different generations. Some of us have different personality traits given to us by God himself before we were born. But some of the differences between members of the same family come from choices that we make. Decisions that we can neither blame on God, nor our parents, nor the location where we grew up, from the north to the south, to the east to the west, even if we grew up in a different country. And one of the decisions that we get to make is about how we treat each other. Now, let me illustrate. My great, great granddaddy, Harold, uh, was uh, someone that I only met a couple of times. I only have memories of him, I should say, a couple of times in my life. He and my great-great-grandmother, Harold, they had nine children, one of whom was my granny. And all of my life, when we would have a, our annual family reunion, reunion, and my granny was there with her eight brothers and sisters, and they would get to talking. Every year, I heard them some, at some point talk about their dad, and I never heard anyone at any time ever say anything flattering about him, about their dad. He was apparently the meanest guy they had ever, any of them had ever met. All of them believed that the only reason he had children was for the free child labor he would get for running the farm. And he treated them exactly like that. No compassion, no fatherly advice, no love, just meanness to his kids, to his wife, to pretty much everybody everywhere. Not necessarily abuse, more like neglect or contempt, lack of empathy and affection, just uncaring. But my granny, who grew up under this man, was the complete and total opposite of him. She, she did have character that was not weak. She was not a pushover. She could be tenacious. She knew how to stand her ground. And yet she was deeply connected emotionally to her kids and to her family and to her grandkids. She deeply cared, and it was obvious. I was really close with her. She would always listen to me. It was almost like she could feel what I was feeling. She always had time. She always made time, and she always treated me like I was the only person on the planet. Now, I know she treated other people that way, too. Still, I was her favorite. I knew it, and everyone else knew it. Now, I'm not telling you all of this as some part of group therapy, although I do feel much better having shared it you know, with you. My motive really isn't me. My motive is us, all of us. My granny is just an illustration from my family, but I bet you have these same stories in your family too that will prove the point that we get to choose, we get to decide how we will treat each other. She and most of her siblings broke the cycle of meanness and dispassion, and they chose instead not to follow their father's lead, but instead to be kind. And that's what we're going to talk about today in our side-by-side -side conversation. We're in this series 
where we're in week three now. We've been looking at the qualities that God wants all of us to have so that we can live well together. Not just in our family, but also in our community, however you define community, whether it's your friend group or your small group here at church or your neighborhood or where you work or your county or even the whole country in the way that you relate to it. See, you and I have the ability to choose to live well towards each other, even if the other people don't make the same choice as they relate to you. We can take the high road, which is not weakness, and it doesn't mean that I can't defend myself. It just means I'm not gonna give in to the culture that has decided that they're gonna treat people in a less than loving way. We talked about that in week one. Today we're in week three, so the first two weeks are worth catching up if you weren't here for one or both of them. So we talked about love in week one, which sounds like a you know, mushy Hallmark movie. It's not. And we also can choose not to keep a record of everybody's offenses forever, like I'm some kind of sin bank your account just keeps growing and growing. Your balance just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I can choose instead to be generous with forgiveness. Just let the sin bank go insolvent. That's what we talked about last week. Today is week three, and we're gonna talk about kindness. Paul, writing to a church that he founded in a place called Coloss, he said these words, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Clothe yourselves with. What an interesting way to put it. Let, let's hang out there for a minute. Today, everybody here, this won't, this won't connect completely with everybody online, uh, but you'll get the point, okay? So stay with me. Everybody who physically came to church today, you decided to come, right? Right? I mean, as far as I know, I haven't gotten a report from all of our campuses, but as far as I know, nobody got kidnapped and like forced under duress to show up to church today. Let's assume that you chose, maybe reluctantly, but still you decided. And once you made the decision to come to church today, somewhere between that moment and this one right here, several things happened. You got out of bed, you did something with your hair, which is a distinct advantage for me because there's literally nothing to do on the top of my head. Anyway, so you, you took a shower and you did whatever you did with your hair and you brushed your teeth, and then what? And then what? As far as I know, again, I haven't gotten a report from all of our campuses today yet, but as far as I know, no one came to church today naked. <laughs> far as I know. You, you also didn't walk to the closet blindfolded and you didn't just grab something without any thought to it at all instead you chose deliberately what you would wear the question is what does it mean to clothe yourselves with kindness to be clothed clothing is presentation isn't it it's what we do to send a message about who we are or how we're feeling or whatever we're, we're deliberate about the clothes that we wear now you can take this word picture Paul uses, you can take it too far. And I promise, we're really not gonna have a conversation about fashion because you clearly would need somebody else for that one. But Paul says we should clothe ourselves with these things, including kindness, which is to say, you get to choose how you present yourself to others. So I've got a friend, part of our church, he loves to wear denim overalls. In addition to being comfortable, which I'm sure he would say they're comfortable, part of what he is saying, part of what he's communicating without ever using words is, I'm not really a suit kind of guy. My son Joshua, who's here today, uh, except for when he's at work, he always wears shorts year round. Like even when it's like five below, I'll be like, dude, what are you doing? He never wear, he always wears shorts. And what he's communicating is, I'm not really a long pants kind of guy. So I have this ongoing argument with my wife, Susan. It's kind of the only time we ever fight, and it has to do with my wardrobe. Because on the one hand, I'm aware that what I wear is, has to be relevant. I, I get that. And so, you know, some time ago, I reluctantly, kind of kicking and screaming, got rid of all my pleated pants and my Argyle sweaters, which I'm still kind of mad about at her, but... Forgiveness is a process. I'm working there. I mean, I watched my message last week multiple times to try to get over this. It's okay. We're going to be all right. On the other hand, on the other hand, I, I want to be me. 
I'm comfortable being me. I'm uninterested in trying to be somebody else. So it's not uncommon in my home for us to have this conversation, which occasionally gets a little heated, about us threading the needle. What style clothes can I wear where I feel genuine and authentic? It's me. And it's not so blatantly dated. Because what we clothe ourselves with is a choice that we make. And what Paul is saying is you can choose to clothe yourselves with kindness, and you should. I love the way William Barclay puts this. He says, Christianity is community. It has on its divine side the amazing gift of peace with God. That comes from God. That's the divine side. And on its human side, the triumphant solution of the problem of living together. What, what he's saying here is, we have the ability and the responsibility to solve the problem of living together. The, the challenge is, that you and I, we don't always have the same idea of what kindness means. Some people see being kind as being weak. If I'm kind, well, people will just take advantage of me and I'll lose and others will win. I can't be bold and kind, can I? Aren't, aren't courage and kindness like opposites of each other? I mentioned how kind my granny was and that's what we think about, isn't it? I mean, kindness is reserved for grandparents, unicorns, <laughs> teddy bears, fairy godmothers. Nothing could be farther from the truth, really. Kindness is not weakness, it's strength. It's strength. It's the choice to treat someone with respect, even when I disagree with them, because what they believe doesn't have to define me. So while they're yelling, I can choose to remain calm. While they talk over me, I can choose to listen. When they're unkind, I can choose to still be kind. I don't have to retaliate. I don't have to be the loudest to win the argument. And I don't have to cave in. At the same time, I don't have to be taken advantage of. I don't have to give up. I just have to be kind. So let's take a minute and talk about what kindness means. What is kindness? I'm, I'm just gonna give you my definition. My working definition for kindness is the treatment of another with respect, help, and care, regardless of how I'm being treated. The treatment of someone else with respect, help, and care, regardless of how I'm being treated, particularly by them, how they're treating me. So let's be honest about this. Most of us respond to disrespect with disrespect. Most of us respond to neglect with neglect. Many of us respond to a lack of care with an attitude that says, well, I don't care either. Our normal mode of operation is reciprocation. Our normal mode of operation is reciprocation. I treat you the way that you treat me. In other words, check this out. This is what this, is what this really means. I allow your behavior to define mine. Can you see how unhealthy that is? We give up control of our decision for how we will behave, and I give it to you based on how you behave. If I could be so bold, that is weakness. Choosing to be kind regardless, that's strength. When my kids were growing up, we really played hard. We really played hard. I mean really hard. We fought, we played hide and seek, we ran around the house, we did all kinds of stuff. We broke stuff in the house. If I'm honest, we broke all the stuff in the house. I always said that I wanted my home not to be a museum, but the fun house. And it was, and it still is. One of my, one of my kids' favorite games to play was what they came to call the ball game. Not a friendly game of catch or sit on the floor and roll the ball back and forth. How boring. No, this ball game was where we took a, I took an air-filled ball with no pressure, not, not a pressurized ball, the kind you buy in the cage at a department store, Walmart, someplace like that, and, and you can get them for a buck or two. And I would stand at the bottom of the staircase with three of them. My kids would go to the, stop. There's a, to the top of the staircase. There's a landing and a wall behind the landing and a bedroom on this side and a bedroom on this side. And the idea was that they were to run through the kill zone without me being able to hit them with the ball as I stood at the bottom of the staircase. Now, when they were little, when they were little, and little, little kids are just, they're just so dumb, they, they, would, 
they, they thought, which, is, which you can always win, it's just so cool. So they thought that if they got a running start from this bedroom, that they could go faster through the kill zone and you, you would not be able to hit them. But the truth is, the pitter-patter of the feet along the way allowed you to perfectly time the missile. And so if, they, if you did this right, when they hit the middle of the kill zone, the, the ball would catch them somewhere like here and peg them to the back wall, wham, and they would bounce around like a pinball machine. They'd usually fall, there might be some bleeding, their eyes would be crossed for a while, and then they'd get up and wanna keep playing. People ask me, do you play this with your grandkids? I said, I play with my grandkids now. Kinsley, just the other day, she says, uh, Papa, that hurt? I said, it's supposed to hurt. Throw the ball back, girl. So we just kept playing. We would, well, I would play this with my kids until I thought my arm was gonna fall off. My, I would be completely soaking wet with sweat. We'd play it for hours. So dads, by the way, this is all on the house. This is, this is free charge. Dads, here's, I, got, I got some advice for you. If you wanna play this game, it's usually best if mom's not home. And you probably ought to have a first aid kit nearby and some fresh paint, right? So we, in my house, we loved to play hard. My kids would stand at the door literally every day I'd come home from work and my kids would be standing there and they wouldn't say, hey dad, we, we love that you're home or you know, how was your day? Or you know, can I get you, you know, a drink, a cup of coffee or anything? This is what they'd say, they'd stand at the door, I wouldn't even be out of the car, dad, can we play beat you up every day? We played beat you up, it'd be the first thing we'd do. And we had some rules about beat you up. And there were some rules like no hitting in the face or the head, unless I'm throwing a ball at you, that was off limits. But, uh, and no hitting in the face or the head. And as they got older and as my kids got stronger, beat you up meant they could actually hurt me. So we had this new rule as my kids got to be, I don't know how old they were, like seven or eight or something like that. I would say to them something like this, I would say, look, you wanna play beat you up, I'm cool with it. We're gonna play beat you up, we're gonna have a great time. It's gonna be so much fun. But now you're a little bit older, so I need you to know there's a new rule. However hard you hit me, that's how hard I'm gonna hit you. Not save the email, I tell you, my, they, my kids had a great time with this. Also, they don't ask me to serve kid men around here. I don't really know why, but, and I'm, but I'm cool with it. So, uh, but I would say, however hard you hit me, that's how, now I'm never, dad is never gonna hit you harder than you hit me, but you just need to keep that in mind, okay, while we're playing beat you up, okay? And this was actually seriously an effective tool when leveling the playing field with my ever strengthening children. It is a terrible strategy for living side by side. A terrible strategy. Paul said it like this, he said, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil, overcome evil with good. So I think about uh, one of our mo uh, modern military options in America at least is what they call proportional response. It's the idea that we have at our disposal the option of responding to an attack in kind, proportional response. Sort of like my, my changing rule of beat you up with my ever-growing kids, right? But Paul says that the follower of Jesus must take a different approach must take the opposite approach. Because your enemy would not feed you if you were hungry, but that's exactly what you're going to do to him. And, and if you find that your enemy is thirsty, they wouldn't give you anything to drink in the reverse situation, but that's exactly what you're gonna do with them. You're gonna give them something to drink, right? And the result of all this, if you do it the way Paul is prescribing, is you will win them over, or at least have the chance to win them over. Mistreatment is never won by proportional response. We overcome it with good. Because revenge breaks the spirit. Retaliation breaks the spirit, but kindness moves the heart. Now I wanna make this really practical for you, and what I'm about to give you as a point of reflection might be painful, and I recognize that. But for those of you who've been around a little while, I think, I think there's some trust you have with me. I'm asking you to trust me in this. I want you to think about you for a minute, just you. 
I don't want you to think about the person sitting next to you. I don't want you to think about the person who you're, you're, you thought about five seconds ago. Oh, I sure wish he was here to hear this. I have to send him this link. He sure needs this. I want you to think about that person. I don't want you to think about your husband or your wife or your parent or your child. I just want you to think about you. When you feel that someone's not treating you well, how do you respond? When you feel like your character is being attacked or your motives are being questioned, what do you usually do? When you're in an argument with someone you love and their temperature goes into the red zone, do you take your temperature there too? Because here's what I see happen all the time. Families, especially husbands and wives, and parents and kids, people who live in the same home together, they treat each other with disdain and disregard and disrespect. And I want you to think about this with me for a minute. We work around people who are occasionally rude to us or short with us, and we ignore that. We go to the ball field, and we're not always given respect, but we shake that off, and then we get home. And someone asks us the wrong question with the wrong tone, the wrong time, or the wrong assumptions, and instead of believing the best and responding with kindness, we respond in kind. We volley back to their side. We send it back over hard where they played this game before so they know it's coming and they hit it back harder, and you hit it back harder, and back and forth it goes until before you know what's really happening, you got World War III, which is also not the first time that's happened. You got people saying things that they would never say to someone else, treating each other in a way that they would be shocked if they could just stand outside and watch it happen or hear the words that they use. If they could know what they're doing to each other, why is it that the people we say we love the most are the people we're most apt to hurt with our lack of consideration and respect and empathy and care and kindness? But you and I, we have the chance to choose a better way. We can choose a better way. We can choose the way of kindness. Paul said, when we're cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we're slandered, we answer kindly. When we're cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. And when we're slandered, we answer kindly. Can you say that about you? Do you bless when someone curses you? Do you endure persecution? Do you respond with kindness when you aren't treated that way? I know this is hard, but here's a daring exercise. For, for those who are willing to just go on this journey with me, because I'm on it too, maybe you could think about asking this question. It's a hard question, but you could try asking maybe your spouse, am I kind to you? Am I kind to you? Now, if you do this, I, I just have to tell you, it has to come with an absolute promise from you. If you're gonna ask this question, you have to promise that there will be no repercussions, there will be no punishment, there will be no silent treatment, there will be no argument, there will be no running away, no matter what the answer is, am I kind to you? I just really wanna know. You could ask this of your kids. Kids, you can ask it of your parents. You could ask it of your coworkers or people on your team, am I kind? See, what usually happens, for the few people who might be willing to take this exercise on, the conversation might go something like this. Am I kind to you? Usually. What do you mean, usually? Well, the other day, you weren't so kind when you barged in the door, threw your keys on the table, and barked at me as you ran down the hallway. Well, let me tell you why I did that. I did that because you parked your car in my parking place. And I've told you time and time again, I've asked you not to park your car in my parking place. Can you hear it? What was supposed to be a quest for understanding became instead a justification for my unkindness. Namely, I basically said, it's your fault if you just park your car in the right place. I wouldn't be unkind if you just follow the rules. But kindness isn't really an effort when everything goes my way. It's easy to be kind then, 
the whole conversation is necessary precisely because things do not always go my way. I get grumpy, especially when I'm hungry, which happens a lot. And I get grumpy when I'm tired and I get anxious because I'm often behind schedule and my back's against a wall on some deadline and I cannot stand to be behind a slow driver. I went to a fast food restaurant this week and I walked in the door and because now everybody's going to kiosks and what I order at this particular place, you can't manufacture on the kiosk, I need a person to help me. And I stood there at the counter for five minutes before anybody ever came out. Seriously, no one said, hey, how you doing? I'm sorry, we're a little uh, understaffed today. Just be patient, we'll be right there. No one said anything until after five minutes, somebody finally walked out and mumbled something like, what do you want? I got a lot of reasons to be unkind. I can justify my unkindness. There are lots of people I can blame for my lack of kindness. It's not my fault, it's your fault. It's the Democrats' fault. It's the Republicans' fault. It's the media's fault. It's the government's fault. It's inflation's fault. It's my wife's fault, she's the problem. It's my boss's fault, he's the jerk. It's the school's fault because they're just so stupid. It's the coach's fault because he would not recognize talent if it smacked him in the face. It's the restaurant's fault for lack of leadership. It's the slow driver's fault for not getting a life. It's my professor's fault for being too demanding. It's the bank's fault for requiring payment. It's the doctor's fault because he won't write the prescription. There's no shortage of people to blame. But the truth is, my lack of kindness is no one's fault except mine. Me alone, just me, because I have the ability to choose. I can clothe myself with kindness or not. I wish I could tell you that I'm always kind. I'm not. I'm not. I think I'm more aware of it today. I think I'm more kind more often today. But I still have the tendency to go in the other direction. Can you relate to that? Susan and I had some gift cards, three gift cards to be exact, that we'd been given to this local restaurant. Um, and it wasn't those kind of gift cards that have like eight restaurants on it. You can use it all over the place. It was one restaurant, not a franchise. I mean, not a, not a chain restaurant, just one single location restaurant. And it had the name of the restaurant written on the cards. Like just, you could only use it there. So we go out to eat. I take the three gift cards. We sit down. We have a very nice dinner. And at the end of the dinner, the server brings the check over and she lays the check on the table and I pull the three gift cards out of my pocket and I kind of slide them across the table. And I said to her, hey, I don't really know how much is on these cards, but I'm sure between the three of them, there's enough here to pay for our meal. And she looked at the cards, smile left her face, now she's frowning and she says, oh, we don't take two of those anymore. Two of those cards we don't take. Come again. These gift cards have your restaurant's name on them. I mean, how, what do you mean you don't take the card? It's got your restaurant's name on it. I could, some of you are with me right now. You're, you can feel like your breathing's getting shallow and you, you, your heart rate's going up. That was me. And so the, ser the server did, had no idea what to do. She seemed completely flustered and sh she ran off to get help. I don't know if it was help to like get me out or help to like help with the, I don't know what the, but she just left. And so I'm sitting there and as soon as she got, as soon as the server, you know, walked away, I'm formulating all my responses in my head. I got and Susan reaches across the table and she says something like, don't be unkind. And I took a deep breath because I knew she was right. I didn't have to give up, but I didn't have to be rude either. I could stand up for myself and be kind at the same time. See, we can all learn to treat people with respect, even in our disagreements. Now, 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, it, an encounter like I had at that restaurant that day, it, it would have taken me some time to come down from that. I, I'm better now, I'm a lot better now, but I'm still getting better at being kind. It's not always natural, but it is always possible are you hearing me? This is true for you too. It may not always be natural, 
but it is always possible within your power. One final note about this. Kindness has become conspicuously absent from our political discord. So, if this is you, follower of Jesus, if that's who you are, if that's the title that you claim to wear, you are out of bounds when you treat others with disdain and disrespect, even in your disagreement. And your behavior on social media and other venues is a reflection on the one you say you follow. When you treat people kindly, you reflect well on Jesus Christ. I love the way that Barry Corey puts it in his book, Love Kindness. He said this, rather than the harshness of firm centers and harsh edges or the weakness of spongy centers and soft edges, why don't we start with kindness? Kindness is the way of firm centers and soft edges. You don't have to give up your convictions You don't have to be weak and you don't have to be timid. Instead, you can take the most courageous road and stand up for your convictions without hatred, without bitterness, without belittling, without name calling, without winning at all costs because kindness is winning. And if I have to win without it, that's losing to me. Kindness is the way of firm centers and soft edges. Choose kindness. What if we live with the heart of kindness? What if we love like we've been loved? If that's all that we're remembered for, well, let that be enough. So when they stand to tell the stories of who we are and what we've done, of a thousand things that we could leave behind us. If they say just one word, let that word be kindness. A legendary Bible scholar, a guy named William Barclay, he one time said, so much Christianity is good, but unkind. He spoke those words like half a century ago Imagine what he would say today. We are not leaving a legacy of kindness. Our strategy of combative Christianity is leaving a damaged path behind us that is turning the world away from Jesus, not towards him. But you and I can still change this. If we'll choose kindness in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities, if we'll choose kindness as a response to others when they treat us without it, I believe that over time, people might start taking a second look at the one whose name we bear. And in the process, our homes and our communities will become places of peace and our lives will be less anxious as we realize that we can choose kindness regardless of whether others around us do that. And we'll find that as we choose kindness consistently over time, Others will too. Let our hearts be quick to listen and our life be slow to speak. Passion and humility. We're reaching past the lines that words like us in them are drawn. No one will find common ground together at the cross. What if we live with a heart of kindness? What if we love like we've been loved? If that's all that we're remembered for, let that be enough. So when they stand and tell the stories, who we are and what we've done, of a thousand things that we can leave behind us. If they say just one word, let that word be I've been forgiven I can show mercy Cause it's mercy I've received And it's the kindness of my Father That brought me back to life It's His kindness that still brings me to my And I want to live with 
the heart of kindness. I want to love like I've been loved. If that's all that I'm remembered for, let that be enough. I want to stand and tell the story. You're amazing, love, when you hear the fighters To rescue and redeem us in your kindness Let my life be a reflection of your kindness We can change the world with kindness We can change the world We can change the world with kindness. You can change your world with kindness. It's a choice that you can make over and over again, every day, in every situation. And this week, I hope you'll look for the right opportunity to have the courage and humility to ask someone close to you, am I kind to you? Having that conversation and then choosing kindness is a powerful way to live side by side. Thanks for being here today come back next week for the last week of our side-by-side -side series. We'll see you then.